Good. So um, I need to excuse myself. My voice is a little bit, um, um, I don't know, strange because I uh, caught a cold. Uh, not in the not in the weather here, but uh, in the weather uh, from uh, in the nice weather in Belgium. <laughs> not so nice weather. Um, so I'm a I'm a two-trick pony. So. Um, I've got two tricks. Uh, one is upstream Kanban. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And then the other one is uh, uh, FlowLab, uh, which is an environment that we're uh, uh, marketing in terms of um, uh, having people experience flow uh, through, a, through a business simulation. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, um, shaping demand, creating customer pool, so going it beyond the, the boundaries of the team and extending it to, uh, mostly towards, uh, towards the business and towards the customers. So a little quiz as a, as a starter. So suppose in your organization or the organization that you're, you're working with um, uh, or the team that you're working in or with, um, suppose that you've been able to uh, increase the delivery rate by 40% You've been able to cut the lead times, uh, so the time between starting something and finishing something. You've been able to cut the lead times from eight to two weeks. And then uh, at the same time, uh, the quality has, uh, has increased. Uh, so it, it didn't go at the cost of quality. Uh, it's really the quality also has, uh, has become better. Would you consider that a success? Would you open the bottles of champagne and start celebrating victory? No. no. no? Why not? Because you might have heard of the wrong things. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so for many organizations, uh, to a certain extent, from one standpoint, it is, it is a success, right? For many organizations, this would be a, su a success. Um, but it's only a local, whoops. I'm getting uh, feedback. Maybe I, yeah. So um, um, it is a success within the confines of uh, of your development or your delivery or your IT organization. Uh, but it's only a local success. Eh? You might be have become faster and better at producing the wrong things, for example. Okay. So um, what organizations today are looking for is not just agile development. Yeah, because the, the, uh, the figures that I showed are figures in terms of becoming better at agile development. Uh, what organizations are looking for today is not just agile development, it's, uh, it's business agility, right? It's including the customer, uh, the business, uh, it's including engaging uh, the whole organization, it's engaging uh, even your users uh, uh, or your consumers uh, into, the, into the process. And so we need to look not just at a little part, we need to look at, uh, at the, the whole. So organizations are looking for business agility. And in that uh, quest, um, in that challenge, uh, they need to uh, fire on all cylinders. Um, so we need to take a, a very broad, organizations need to take a very broad uh, look at, uh, at agility, uh, not just in terms of flow, uh, managing the trade-off between the customer, del delivering to the customer and uh, working optimally internally, right? So uh, managing flow, creating flow, that's not sufficient. Uh, it's also about experimentation, active learning, yeah? um, doing build measure learn type of things, uh, uh, learning about uh, actively learning about imp how to improve your business. Um, and then also in terms of uh, uh, resilience, organizational resilience, collaboration, cross-functional collaboration, uh, removing bottlenecks in the, in the removing not all knowledge bottlenecks. Um, so making the trade-off, managing the trade-off between stability and change uh, in the organization. So I think, um, no sound mind could say that 
uh, in terms of business agility, you can only focus on one of those three. Uh, uh, all three are, are important. Uh, um, so if we look a little bit closer to each of them, uh, so it's not only that we need to look at uh, agility in a, in a very comprehensive way, um, in each of those, we also need to look at the whole. Uh, so if we're thinking about flow, uh, um, in terms of business agility, it's not just flow of work uh, downstream. Uh, it's not about only about optimizing your capability to, uh, to meet the demand, but it's also number two, uh, uh, better understanding the needs, anticipating, shaping, uh, creating the demand, uh, so the upstream side. So we're talking not just about flow in the downstream, we're talking about end-to-end -end flow uh, from Genesis of an idea, right? the generation of an idea to actually realization of that uh, idea from a suspected need to a satisfied need. <coughs> and then obviously uh, the balance, uh, the alignment between, uh, between the two, between the upstream and the downstream. Uh, so we need to look at the end-to-end -end flow. Um, in terms of uh, learning, so it's not about only about delivering solutions, right? It's about understanding what is the friction that we, we want to resolve. Eh? Discovering what the friction is that we, uh, we want to resolve. What is the problem that we want to solve? What is the opportunity that we want to capture? Yeah? So again, it's not just about agility downstream, developing and delivering. It's about the end-to-end -end, uh, knowledge discovery process. Discovering the friction. Uh, designing a solution and then developing and delivering that solution. And creating short feedback loops. Uh, we've understood that in the meantime. Uh, feedback loops in terms of, very short feedback loops in terms of viability. Is it worthwhile to build it? Uh, um, desirability, can the users do their job with it? And feasibility, uh, can, we, uh, can we build it? Okay. So again, uh, we, need to look at, uh, we need to look at the whole. Now, in terms of benefits, if you look at end-to-end -end flow, if you look at the entire knowledge discovery process, um, and in terms of improving, where is the biggest uh, improvement, uh, where is the biggest bang for the buck that we can get? Improving the downstream or improving the upstream? Yeah, yeah so our leverage point is very much in the upstream. Yeah. So we can improve downstream, and we need to improve downstream. Yeah? But obviously, uh, there's much more to gain in, uh, in the upstream. Uh, there's much more to gain in terms of making sure that work, you're working on the right problem, making sure that you design a solution that is uh, desirable uh, and feasible. Yeah. So in terms of resilience, um, in terms of resilience, it's not just about the front loop here, eh? genesis, the startup, growth, eh? scaling, and then conservation, eh? keeping your organization running. But it's also in terms of the back loop. What if your demand shifts? Okay. What if your demand shifts? How are you going to cope with that if you have a shifting demand? And not only at organizational level, not only at organizational level, but also at team level. Eh? At team level, we also see at all levels in the organization we also see this, uh, this phenomenon in terms of it's not just sufficient uh, to be able to deliver against the demand now, yeah, but you also need to be able to cope with shifting demand. Uh, demand doesn't come in uh, steadily and uh, in, a, in a very stable, long-term stable way. It shifts and uh, it's, an, it's uneven. Yeah? So we need to be able to cope with uh, shifting demand also. So what is the, um, the upstream challenge in all of that? So the upstream challenge is um, different from the downstream challenge. Uh, downstream, we know that um, in the end, a team is uh, most productive if it's organized around a stable flow of work, right? So that I think we understand uh, very well uh, today. Uh, so a team is best organized around a stable flow of work. Um, but then very early on in the upstream, does that the demand come in 
in a very stable way, in a very even way? Do opportunities come in uh, in a very even uh, in a very even pace or tempo? Yeah. Um, not at all, right? Not at all. They come in. Sometimes you have a lot of opportunities coming in, and then no opportunities coming in. So it's a very uh, unstable uh, and unpredictable, uh, especially very unpredictable uh, inflow. So the challenge of the upstream is to overcome that gap. Uh, the friction, uh, most of the time, the friction between upstream and downstream is in terms of the fact that upstream things come in very unpredictably, and downstream we organize ourselves best around a very, uh, a very predictable, even flow of work. Okay, so that's the gap that, uh, that we need to overcome. That friction. Um, that challenge gets, uh, gets even more complicated. Um, it's, uh, it's, even, it's made even more prob problematic because along the way in the upstream, we need to make decisions, right? Okay, we need to make decisions. We need to make decisions in terms of um, what are the things that we're going to do? Uh, which things do we, uh, are we going to give priority? And which things are we going to give less priority? Uh, which things are we going to do? Which things are we not going to do? Um, that uh, decision uh, making process typically has many external dependencies. Uh, we are dependent, uh, dependent on customers, decision makers. Uh, and again, that creates even more unpredictability in, uh, in the upstream process. Okay. So overcoming the gap between a very unpredictable incoming flow and a very predictable uh, uh, outgoing flow. Uh, that's, uh, that's the challenge. Is that clear? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, on top of that, we typically have an, uh, an impedance mismatch uh, in organization. And, um, in my experience, an, uh, a mismatch that is only getting bigger and bigger. Um, the impedance mismatch is if your, uh, your cadence of delivery is not matched by the cadence of uh, decision making, the cadence of demand, then obviously you get all kinds of frictions. Huh? If you have a decision, a yearly decision making process and a daily delivery process, yeah, that creates a lot of friction. Huh? So the more agile our downstream teams are becoming, if our decision making process is still this old fashioned yeah, yearly budgeting round, yeah, we have a lot of friction between, uh, between the two. Yeah. So that's the, uh, the impotence mismatch, uh, the misalignment between uh, the upstream and the downstream. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to, um, to illustrate uh, this a little bit on the basis of, an, uh, of a small case, an IT maintenance case. Um, I've chosen that case because uh, it's small enough uh, to be uh, to be understandable, um, and also because um, it's uh, it's a good example of a of a healthy challenge. Yeah. So in this case, you see on the graph uh, on the slide what you see is um, the uh, the reddish red orange line is uh, incoming change requests. The green line is uh, outgoing change requests. So change delivered. Yeah. So um, the closed change requests. And then the blue bars in the background is the backlog, the open change requests. Okay. So what you see is a team that, um, an IT maintenance scheme that is just not able to cope with the incoming demand. Yeah. If you see the, the backlog, it's kind of stable, but still creeping up a little bit. Yeah, creeping up a little bit. Yeah. So that means that the incoming demand is a little bit bigger than the outgoing demand. And at the same time, you already have quite a substantial backlog. Yeah. Now that is, in terms of change, that is a very healthy challenge. Yeah. It, the challenge is not too big for the team to be completely in, uh, in panic. Yeah. And it is a challenge because if there's no challenge, uh, it's hard to uh, incentivize the team to change. Right? I see a lot of teams where they can cope, easily cope with uh, the incoming demand. Um, it's very hard to, uh, to change those teams. So it's a, a healthy challenge in terms of change. Um, so that's kind of the team, uh, the case 
uh, it's a it's a 15 person team across different uh, across different competencies across different skills uh, with demand from different uh, from many different sources within uh, within the business within the business um, so as in many cases we started with uh, a Kanban. Now, why do I put quotes around the Kanban here? Uh, well, I put quotes around the Kanban because um, we did a visualization of the end-to-end -end, uh, flow, uh, starting from incoming requests up to delivery uh, towards the customer. So we visualized both the upstream as well as the downstream. But our starting point, as is the case in, in many, uh, many situations, our starting point was the downstream. Yeah, so we started implementing uh, work in progress limits uh, downstream and then all the rest upstream and then uh, the delivery was, uh, was quite uh, just a visualization. So not a real Kanban system yet, proto Kanban. Okay. So our focus was on what I call uh, system Kanban uh, in analogy with system lead time. Uh, so it was from uh, we uh, commit to, de to develop the request up to the point where it was ready for user, user acceptance testing. Okay. That's where we, uh, we focused on. Um, we had some results, uh, maybe not spectacular, uh, but still uh, quite good results. Good enough for them to present to their uh, business stakeholders uh, and then uh, gain support for the, from the business stakeholders. Uh, uh, for what they were doing, and uh, and the business stakeholders recognized as, this as uh, as a, a solid result. Previously, there was quite some friction. You can imagine that what the friction was. Yeah, this big backlog created quite some friction between the business and uh, and the IT maintenance team. Uh, the long lead times. We're starting from a lead time of more than uh, 13 weeks. Long lead times were a point of friction uh, between the business and, and the team. Yeah. Um, by limiting the WIP, uh, we, uh, <coughs> the lead time was reduced to uh, approximately six weeks. And what you also see on the graph is that you see the, the delivery on the cumulative flow diagram. You see the delivery, uh, the bottom line, eh? the, the burn up line. Eh? Um, you see it slightly going up. So that means that our delivery rate was also uh, was also increasing, not substantially, yeah, uh, fifteen percent. Uh, but in this case, fifteen percent makes the difference between a backlog that is growing and a backlog that becomes stable, and maybe a backlog that uh, that will shrink after a while. Okay, so it doesn't need to be an, a throughput, a doubling of your throughput. Yeah? Sometimes fifteen twenty percent is. Uh, is already sufficient. So should we declare success? Yeah, should we declare success? Wait a second before we do so. Yeah. In terms of agility, yeah, in the three dimensions that I talked about, yeah, in terms of agility, while we didn't, uh, we didn't implement uh, an agile method, yeah, we just started limiting the work in progress, yeah, we saw quite some results. Yeah. In terms of flow, uh, we saw the transition from a focus on I do my work and I keep keep being busy towards now we know what our capacity is and we stay within our capacity so we create flow our lead times are shrinking yeah in terms of uh, learning eh, our lead times uh, start to become stronger so our feedback loops could become strong uh, could, could become shorter so we could focus uh, more on on getting feedback. Yeah? Um, on the deliverables, not on the intermediate, but on the uh, on the actual working uh, uh, software. And then, in terms of resiliency, um, the team started collaborating more. Previously, uh, what happened is when they had a change request, and two persons had to work on it, and one person was on holiday, the other person started anyhow. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't coordinate, they didn't collaborate on the change request. Uh, one person, because he wanted to keep busy, so started working on the change request, even if the other person could not finish it. Uh, what we saw now is that because they needed to keep in, within the WIP limits, they, they, there was a pressure to start collaborating, uh, which created less, uh, uh, which uh, uh, 
uh, created some knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing between the, between the team members, uh, so that uh, uh, we reduced the, the knowledge bottlenecks a little bit in the team. So, should we declare uh, victory? Should we declare victory here? Should we declare victory? Uh, obviously not, uh, otherwise the presentation would be finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, uh, um, they, could, uh, they could like, to their business, they could say yes. Uh, but then I talked with a couple of uh, people from the business and what I said is like, we're very happy, Patrick, that uh, what is happening in the, in the IT maintenance team. But you know what? In the end, uh, we issue a request. Yeah? And then when the request is delivered, it still takes a very, very long time. Yeah? Sure. Now, once you start commit to the request, yeah, then it's quite kind of predictable. But for us, the clock starts ticking way earlier when we actually issue the request, not when you decide that you can actually start working on the, re on the request. So that was one input. Another input was the, uh, uh, the IT manager came to us and said like, Patrick, this is all very good, but uh, in the end, I'm not sure whether we're, st we're delivering the right stuff. Yeah. So we might have become now better at delivering the wrong stuff. So we need to work on that. So we looked at uh, the end-to-end -end system. Um, so yes, our downstream, our system lead times started to become uh, shorter and a little bit more stable. Uh, but if you look at, you can't treat the numbers there, the left hand, the red uh, bar chart, uh, if you look at the customer lead times, we're still talking about customer lead times that might exceed uh, 30 weeks. Yeah, which is very still very long. Uh, so still a lot of spi uh, a lot of time spent was was spent outside of the system camman. Okay. So a lot of time was spent in preparing the request, deciding on the request, and then uh, before the commitment point, and then maybe also some time was spent after uh, the the request was uh, ready for being uh, accepted. Okay. So that's what we saw. Uh, what we also saw is uh, quite some loopbacks. Yeah. So um, items that uh, uh, were committed. Yeah. So if you look at the board here, so this is the upstream. Here's our backlog ready for to be committed, yeah. and this is actually our commitment point. Here we commit, and there we uh, we actually do the work. Okay. So a lot of items, especially in analysis. In this uh, photograph, you don't see it very well, but especially in analysis, but also here, we see a lot of items that got blocked. Yeah. Um, and in many cases, they got blocked because an assumption was made upstream that turned out to be a, a false assumption. Yeah. So that's what we call loopbacks. Yeah. So we saw, still saw quite some loopbacks. Also, items that were delivered, and then when they were delivered, they actually led to new changes. Um, Again, an indication that some assumptions were made in the upstream that turned out to be false assumptions uh, and that uh, those new changes were a way of correcting that. <coughs> so long customer lead times, loopbacks, um, an uneven flow. Yeah? If you look closely at the board, um, the upstream, uh, you see what I call a barbell flow. A barbell is weightlifting. Yeah, the, that's a barbell. So the weight is at the ends, uh, at the opposite ends. Okay. So on the upstream board, you see quite some tickets here, no tickets here, and then a lot of tickets here. Yeah. Which from a flow perspective um, raises questions, right? If you see that on a board, you get suspicious, right? It's not an even flow. So what was happening there? Um, so a little bit further analysis. Um, so on top of that, on top of that, so on top of this barbell flow, we saw also a lot of expediting directly from here. Okay. So items that were stuck in here, typically more strategic items, 
yeah, with lots of stakeholders involved. They got stuck in here very early on in the upstream and then suddenly they become super important and super urgent and they needed to expedite, yeah, to be expedited downstream. Yeah. Now, um, because the team already committed quite some work downstream, in many cases this also led to um, an, uh, an overcommitment downstream yeah? because they're expedited, yeah? they're committed on top of the work that was already committed, so uh, some overcommitment uh, also downstream. Um, now, obviously, because the high value, high risk items get expedited, what happens with these items? Yeah, they get stuck in here. Eh? They're always getting bypassed by those more important items. Yeah? So that created quite some backlog uh, in front of the commitment point. Okay? So the barbell flow uh, is the result of, on the one hand, high risk, high value items getting stuck in very early on in the upstream. Low value, low risk items getting stuck here in front of the commitment point and then items being expedited across, uh, across the board. Okay. So, in the end, while we did quite some effort in terms of creating flow downstream, uh, uh, we, st we still were uh, influenced by uh, what was happening upstream, so the upstream still created some chaos uh, in the team. So reason enough to, um, to start looking at, uh, at the upstream, right? So in the end, uh, we saw friction rather than, uh, rather than flow. Yeah. So all kinds of things happening. Uh, Overprocessing in the analysis, large inventory in front of the commitment point, a lot of wasted effort. Uh, so we have all these items analyzed and they get stuck. Yeah. So we're not doing anything with it, which is a wasted effort. Um, very late selection and not based on importance, but based on uh, capacity. Lowbacks, uh, expediting. So not really a, a not a really nice picture. Okay. So what to do about it? Why was this picture there? Um, well, this picture was there because, in the end, we did, uh, we did work on agility downstream. Eh? But we had, in the upstream, we still had some 20th century management uh, relics. Eh? Some uh, legacy of the past. Yeah? Some legacy of the past. Eh? While we've worked on creating flow here, yeah? what we still saw is, in the upstream, some phase gates decision points, yeah, phase gates, and then in the end, in between the, the phases, in the, between the phase gates, many, very much organized around functions in the organization, right? So here's first the business does its work, uh, needed to fill in some scorecarding uh, to prioritize the, uh, the, chain, the requests. Um, they did some business analysis, then it got, uh, got approved, then uh, the solution designer started working, it got approved, and each of these phase, phase gates is quite, uh, actually in a handover point uh, from one phase to another. Uh, so that's kind of a, a waterfall in, in the upstream, uh, upstream waterfall. So this was uh, one of the reasons why we had these loopbacks. Yeah. So many false assumptions that we make in the upstream eh, lead to uh, loopbacks even if we're doing iterations downstream. Okay. Um, so we decided to redesign the upstream. So redesign the upstream not around phase gates, uh, but around uh, integration points. So integration points, rather than having handovers between different teams, uh, we had multiple stakeholders at the same time, different, uh, uh, across the different functions. We had different persons at the same time look at the problem, analyze the problem, agree on what the problem was, what needs to be solved. In terms of designing the solution, rather do, than going directly from the business requirements directly into detailed analysis, we had a point where we said, let's look 
with all the different uh, involved stakeholders, let's look at, uh, make a concept of what, uh, what the solution will look like. A synthesis rather than analysis. Eh? Look at the whole, get uh, a shared common vision about what we're going to build before we go into, uh, into a detailed analysis. Eh? So rather than having just capture and analysis and analyzing with the diff separately with the different stakeholders, eh? we had a workshop together uh, to create a shared common vision, a synthesis of, uh, of what we're going to, to build, develop, and then only then we, we went into uh, detailed analysis. So um, we redesigned the upstream Kanban around, uh, around that process. Uh, so capture, synthesis. After the synthesis, that was sufficient to do an approval, and then only then uh, a, uh, an, uh, a, a detailed analysis, a more detailed analysis. Um, so the synthesis, uh, for example, to, for people that are familiar with uh, story mapping, uh, story mapping is a, is a, was something that was crucial in that, uh, in, it's actually the key technique that we were using in the, in the synthesis. Yeah. Very cheap, uh, cheap and, and a fast way to create a shared common vision. And the, the, the key point here is cheap and fast, yeah, cheap and fast, before going into the expensive analysis. Okay, so uh, that was one relic that we needed to uh, clean up. Uh, another relic was uh, uh, this idea of optimal selection, right? Remember what I said? The business stakeholders needed to uh, fill in this scorecard, and the purpose of the scorecard was to prioritize. Uh, so this is the, the way we think about, uh, traditionally, you start about uh, the decision making in the upstream, eh, we want to make an optimal decision. We want to create optimal value, right? And so how do we do that? Well, we take all our initiatives, eh, A, B, and C are initiatives, and we evaluate them against uh, a set of criteria. Eh, uh, what is the ROE? What is the, the payback? Uh, what uh, is it, the strategic value? And so on and so on. Eh. And then based on that scoring, yeah, uh, we select the, uh, the, most, uh, the most high value items uh, to be developed. And that's the traditional thinking. Um, what is created for us is uh, a very uneven flow. Yeah? Because obviously, we need to make, uh, make that scorecard. Yeah? So we need to make that scorecard. And we need to compare all those different items next to each other. So what happens uh, naturally is we start batching because we need to compare. Yeah? So our demand starts fluctuating up and down. Yeah? Yeah? So uh, the extreme example is the yearly budgeting round. Eh? Yeah? So, uh, yeah? so we batch all the decisions. And then the teams are like waiting for work. And then suddenly all uh, hell breaks loose. And then all the work is released in the organization. Yeah. Now, what we expect from the uh, organization is to match the capability with the demand. Yeah. But obviously, they can't perfectly match the capability against the demand. Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, here the demand is rising, so we need to scale up. Okay. Demand is going down again, so oh, we need to scale down. Yeah. And then, up, we need to scale up again. Yeah. So, um, so that's the expectation that is, uh, that is created there. Um, but obviously, that creates a lot of loss in terms of overcapacity, and then here, overburdening. Right? So that creates a lot of loss in the, uh, in the organization. Um, so that's the resilience part. Huh? We just can't scale up and down a team without uh, it always incurs a certain cost if we want to scale up and scale down. Huh? Yeah. So that was uh, uh, one consequence. Um, and then uh, the other consequence that we saw is that despite all the effort that we were putting in into the decision making, into making this uh, analysis, into filling in these scorecards, in the end what we saw is suboptimal value creation. Yeah. What was present in front of our commitment point was all kinds of low value items. Yeah, was all kinds of low value items. Yeah, remember, 
yeah, on the board, on the upstream board. In front of the commitment point, we saw a lot of low value work being ready. And all the high value work, where is it stuck? In the decision making process. The decision making process that we were putting in place, or that was put in place, to make sure that we had the highest value items was actually creating a situation where it was mainly the low value items that, uh, that uh, uh, were ready to be, uh, to be executed. Why? Yeah, obviously, the low value items are items that don't have a lot of stakeholders. Typically, it's only more operational, so it's only for one part of the business. There's not a lot of decision making that uh, needs to be done. The value is low, but the risk is low also, so it's, the decision making is quite simple. The high value items are more risky, more uncertain, are involve more, uh, more stakeholders, involve more uh, decision making. Yeah? So they get stuck. Okay? So in the end, uh, we have a high decision making effort because we want to make the optimal decision. Yeah? We want to make the optimal decision in terms of making sure that we have the highest value item. Yeah? But in, in that process, yeah, we put a lot of effort in the decision-making process. Now that contradicts the entire idea of making the decision, because if you need to make a lot of, put in a lot of effort to make the decision, you need to make sure that you put in the, the effort in the highest value items. Because if you put a lot of effort in one, making a decision about one item, you can only evaluate a limited number of items. Yeah? So the decision-making process actually contradicted itself uh, quite a bit. Okay. So how did we solve this problem? Well, uh, to make a distinction. Yeah. To make a distinction between low-value items and high-value high items. Okay. So to distinguish between items that may be lower value but highly certain, where we said like, okay, this is a low risk request, so we can do the full assessment effort to, in order to prepare them as a work item. Okay. Or this is an uncertain item, highly uncertain, maybe high value, but highly uncertain. So rather than putting the entire assessment effort in there, what we said is we're going to create an option first. So we do an, an, a very low cost, low, uh, very rapid, uh, assessment. So we can make an, an initial assessment here before we put in the full assessment effort. Okay. Now remember yeah, the process that we redesigned: yeah, capture, synthesis, analysis. Yeah. So that maps onto onto this process. Okay. So that meant that for highly uncertain items, we went through a two-step process for the assessment, first creating an option, then the full commitment. For low value, low risk items, we just immediately went into a, a more detailed analysis. So that was one part of the solution. Uh, the other part of the solution was uh, to implement uh, a triage process. Uh, in the end, we still have more demand than we can cope with. Okay? But now, we start to have a basis to, um, uh, to distinguish uh, so, just like in a field hospital, eh, we start creating a triage uh, in order to protect our downstream, uh, our downstream team eh, from overburdening. Okay. So, how does that work in, an, uh, in a field hospital? Not a, sure, eh, if you went to emergency, you might have seen this, eh, you get a color. Eh? So, black means we're not going to put in effort because um, it's... Uh, uh, it doesn't. Uh, it will not solve anything. Yeah? Now, in emergency, you won't see a black color that uh, that fast. But in a field hospital, you might see a black color quite uh, uh, more uh, more frequently. Uh, red means uh, this uh, needs to be expedited immediately. Yeah? The patient is. Uh, uh, we need to operate on the patient immediately uh, in order to uh, to uh, rescue him or her. Yellow means. Let me start with the green. Green is the patient is not bleeding. Uh, there's no immediate uh, immediate danger of uh, uh, life-threatening uh, stuff, and there's no risk that uh, that it will escalate. Okay, there's no risk that 
suddenly the patient, the patient will start bleeding out of, uh, uh, out of uh, crucial parts of his body. Yeah. So what do we do with the patient? We leave him in the, in the, in the waiting room. And he can, the patient can even wait for four hours, six hours, eight hours. Yeah. We will pull in the patient when we have capacity, yeah, when we have uh, to fill in a gap. Yellow items means we need to start the treatment yeah, because we know that preparing the patient yeah, will take time. Yeah, so we need to start the treatment so that uh, we are uh, 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 preventing that it, uh, the patient escalates. Okay. Now in terms of our change requests, in terms of our requests, uh, we started implementing that. Black means we need to escalate. Uh, there's something wrong with, uh, with the requests. Uh, we need to escalate in, to a higher level of decision making. Red means we need to expedite. Everybody needs to, uh, to swarm on the request. Yellow means we need to be very proactive on the request, preempt. Yeah? Proactive, we need to start working on it. We need to start bugging the customer, the business. Uh, if we ask questions, we need to have answers because the business will, they will issue the request and they will not answer you, but in the end, when the deadline nears, they will say, where is my request? Yeah. And then the green ones are the ones where we say, we're not even going to invest any, we're not even going to look at requests. Yeah. Because we uh, assess the risk of, for the request escalating as very small. Yeah? So we're only going to pull in the request when we have uh, free capacity. Okay? Because we know the request doesn't require a lot of analysis, eh? it will flow very rapidly through the upstream, so we can pull it in when we need it. So we designed, uh, redesigned the upstream. Um, so you see the triage here. Yellow, green, uh, the reds expedite immediately uh, downstream, and the, the black ones don't stay on the board here, they're, uh, they're escalated. Um, yellow items go through a two step approach, yeah, two step process, green items immediately go into analysis. Yeah. Um, but uh, we only, we have an order point of five items here, meaning that once we have five items that are ready to be committed, we don't pull in any, pull in any more uh, green items. Uh, so that's our order point. Okay. So now we start evening the flow, uh, creating a balance in the flow for downstream to be uh, uh, to have an even flow of incoming work for uh, for downstream. So, are we there yet? Uh, are we there yet? <laughs> Not entirely. Um, so. Business still was in a push mindset. Eh? While we created pull at the worker level, at the team level, business was still pushing in requests. But when we needed uh, help from the business downstream, for example, uh, to unblock some of these blocked items here, sometimes we needed input from the business, the business was not available. Okay? When the business needed to accept an item, sometimes they were not available. So that's an, an indication that the business still has a push mindset. They push work on the team, but they're not pulling work out of the team. Okay. So the way we solve that is to buy a, a very simple um, a cap whip. Yeah. So we created customer Kanban tokens. Customer Kanban tokens are like money huh, for the business. So what we did is every, everybody in the business could issue a request uh, and go through the, the normal procedure of issuing a request there. So we didn't stop people from issuing requests, but um, when you wanted to really have the, uh, the request started, you, needed, uh, you need a Kanban token. Okay? When does the business get that Kanban token back? When the request is delivered. Okay? Now that creates an incentive not to just push work in there, eh, but also to help to, uh, to collaborate with the team to actually deliver the work. Yeah? Because you need the work to be delivered in order to issue more requests. Yeah? Now, that doesn't mean that all requests need to go sequentially. Yeah? The business can, can have more than one Kanban token. Yeah? We actually had uh, multiple Kanban tokens yeah? based on uh, the past, on the history of uh, uh, the number of requests that were delivered to them. Uh, we created more than one Kanban token for each part of the business. Okay. They had, could have multiple requests going on at the same time. Um, so again, are we there yet? 
Yeah, not entirely. Um, so there's still an issue of, uh, yeah, not all requests. And so the upstream downstream cam man is still a very linear, uh, makes still a very linear assumption. First we analyze, then we develop. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, there's an element of uh, experimentation that needs to go in there. Um, so uh, supporting uh, build, measure, learn. Uh, so we didn't integrate that yet. Uh, that's the, the area of discovery Kanban. We didn't integrate that yet. Uh, that's not where the team is, uh, is right now. Uh, they're not, uh, not ready for that yet. Um, so with these elements, I think we have quite a good path towards uh, going from agile development towards uh, uh, business agility. Does that uh, cover the entire area of business agility? No. Uh, uh, it focuses on flow within, uh, within enterprise flow uh, as a support for a, a, a high level of business agility. Um, so enterprise flow, not just downstream, but end to end, okay, and then um, changing the mindset. Yeah, changing the mindset. Uh, if you're only optimizing your downstream team, your delivery capability, what you're doing is you're optimizing your capability as an order taker. Okay. Um, what we, what our intention here was, and what we actually succeeded is to actually not just order taking, but the team helping to shape the demand, yeah? not just. Any demand that comes in is good demand. No, we try to, to shape the demand, work with, uh, with the business, work with the customers to, uh, to uh, better shape the demand, to better make use of the capability that is there. Yeah, so that's the mindset shift that, uh, that we were after. Um, and then in terms of uh, agility, so yes, uh, Camman going from capacity utilization to meeting demand, to outputs, to team collaboration. With the upstream Kanban, uh, we're going towards not just meeting the mount, but shaping the mount. Discovery Kanban, uh, not just outputs, but outcomes. And then um, the customer Kanban, not just collaboration in the team, but collaboration between the customer, uh, the customer and the team. So that's, uh, that's kind of the journey, that, uh, the journey that we went through. Yeah. The, so going from optimizing lead time, throughput, quality, uh, to working with the customer through upstream uh, discovery and, uh, and customer campaign. Good. I think I'm already over time a little bit. Is there, uh, is there time for a question? If nobody says something, then there is time for a question. <laughs> Two minutes? Yeah. Very quick. <laughs> quick question. Uh, did you found a, any case in where the upstream camera is a sales camera? It's about selling a sale to a customer? So, yeah. Um, sales to my customer. So, yeah. So actually, the very first camera that I uh, worked on was in the context of uh, sales and marketing of trainings. Yeah, so that was my first experience with uh, with uh, Kanban, and it was actually an upstream Kanban system. Mm -hmm. yeah, I didn't know better, then, but yeah. Oh. Uh, so how do you how do you work with an even flow? Say three customers uh, buying at the same time, and after that, and that nothing else. Uh -huh. Yeah. So and that is exactly the challenge that uh, that's the upstream challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the upstream challenge. Yeah, and so now if you're in a small business, yeah, um, you don't have enough volume to talk about flow, so it's always going to be a little bit tricky. But once you start to have a little bit of volume, you can start managing it as a, as a flow system. Yeah, so if if your volume is too low, it's hard to talk about the flow system. It's always going to be a little bit ad hoc. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you.